everyone can hear me okay. I changed up my mic settings a little bit. I did not do a further delay, so I, I suspect the video and audio will still be slightly off. Although it was pretty close last time, so I'm not going to fiddle with it live on stream. A little quiet, huh? Okay. Let me try a few different settings here. Is that, how's that? Is that better? Cello asks if they will, if people suffer from strange account names and if there will be possibilities for changing. No, there will not be possibilities for changing. The account name is used as the ID. And if you suffer from a strange account name, perhaps you should have considered that when you created your account, when you created your account, as opposed to making a strange account name. Which, you know, I don't really feel sorry for people who make strange account names when they complain that they have a strange account name. You can also make a new account and close it, close the old one, that's fine. But if you uh, made a strange account and built up history using that strange account, then uh, you don't want to lose that history, then I suggest you keep the strange account. <coughs> okay, so I'm not going to start and dig in too much here until we get started here and a few more people show up. Don't know if any more people will show up. I don't think we're promoting this one as much. Um, I don't know if anybody's linked it in the Discord or in the, any of the Slacks. Could definitely do that. Oh, it actually got put in the announcements stream even. Yeehaw. That, that looks nice. And then, okay, sweet. I don't have as much of a plan today. I understand that your life situation change, changes, Gisello, but, uh, <laughs> you know, account names are actually usually fairly important when you create them. So I suggest that as a, in a, general, as a general habit that uh, you take some time and consider your account name when you create it on, on any site, not just this one. Cormac says he can barely hear me as well, so let me see. Yeti microphone. How about now? Can you hear me better now? Okay, great. Is it still too low or should I bump it up a little bit more? Okay. Awesome. So yeah, so like I was saying, um, almost <laughs> blow out your ears. <laughs> Nice. I could just yell at the microphone. Um, my wife would love that. She'd be like, what are you yelling at downstairs? Why are you yelling at the people on the internet? <laughs> okay. So today I don't have, in fact, let me just do something really quickly. My calm. Do all this so that slightly less weird um, opacity changes here for my screens. So yeah, so for today, uh, I'm going to go through a little bit more of this uh, development onboarding wiki. So I'm going to go through some stuff that I didn't finish covering last time or that I didn't feel like I covered as well as I could have last time. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go back through and talk a little bit more about this bloop setup. And that's what I'm going to do first because that's the sort of setup we use. I'm going to make sure it's set up for me locally again. Um, once I've finished talking about that, the next steps of stuff that I was thinking about talking about would be to go through these optional setups here for um, playing with the computer and stockfish analysis. Um, just to take you through how easy it is to set those up in case that's something you're interested in um, from that perspective. And then after that, I actually don't have anything super concrete planned. One potential idea would be to cover how to use the LeechS API from some sort of client code. So basically just install Python requests or something like that and make a few requests to the LeechS API just to show you how easy it is. Or alternatively to talk about how to do LeechS OAuth integration, although I fear that the LeechS OAuth integration is probably worthy of its own stream as opposed to just being tacked on at the end. Um, the other option that we have, and I'm going to ask all of you for feedback now, is what would you like to see uh, LeechS Dev cover or talk about um, on this stream? So have a think about that, make some suggestions in chat, and some of the people who are paying attention to chat more than I am can um, pass those along to me. Also, how are all of you doing today on Sunday for most people? 
hope everyone is feeling a little bit more relieved today than they were, say, a few weeks ago. I certainly am, you know, a little bit less stressed out. Um, something pretentious asks that we didn't find, whether or not we found a specific issue to cover. And I looked for some again, um, and I did not find any that I was willing to um, API negative te testing. Anyways, uh, I uh, didn't find any um, GitHub issues that I felt comfortable covering in today's stream. Um, there were a few that I um, felt were reasonable for me to cover in a future stream. And so I may, I may definitely do that still. Um, if someone still has one that they'd like to see covered or even just like some small, how do you change something specifically, then I'd be ha more than happy to try and cover that on stream. David Rott asks, can I explain API negative testing? I have never heard of that term before, so no. I don't think I'll be able to explain negative API testing. Okay, just reading this, I uh, feel like I understand negative API testing, which is effectively, I assume, testing against all the different types of um, user input that uh, we can do, that users could possibly put in and trying to actually provide a reasonable um, error message about it. And I'm not a QA tester, David Roth, but uh, from this perspective, I think that uh, I can talk a little bit about this. I don't know as much about this in the context of Leela as I, as I would like to, but the idea behind this with Leela is effectively we try and make sure that there is a sort of HTTP layer, um, which is where the, the HTTP API is actually implemented. And that one would, would basically be responsible for translating all of the HTTP data, which is basically stringly typed, into a more strongly typed uh, piece of information that can be used by the internal module or internal API. And um, we have some automated facilities for doing that. Um, Scala has some automated facilities for doing that where we can just basically say, I want to make sure this is an integer and it'll make sure it's an integer, for example. In the context of something where you need more meaning or more value than just integer, where you want something like, I don't know, a valid user ID, which is not an integer, um, then there's a little bit more in-depth stuff to do in there. But Leela has a lot of that built in already in terms of like, we're well, gonna get a string from a URL or we're gonna get a string from a HTTP request, uh, an API request and we want to be able to turn that into a username. Um, it has some built-in facilities for doing that. Um, I don't, I am not super familiar with um, how well the API turns problems with that data into an appropriate area message, but I do know that Thibaut takes that um, fairly seriously and attempts to um, fix that whenever he can, because I know he rages against other APIs that he has to use when the, um, when the API does not give him an appropriate error message. Okay, any other questions that, uh, in terms of this before we start? I'm just kind of feeling chatty to start the stream, so um, unless we have, unless people are super, super um, keen on getting started right away, I figured I'd answer some questions to start here. So Jeff, Jesse Hef, Hef, Jesse HF, Jesse Hoof, no idea how to pronounce that, asks about setting up the Vagrant, and they run into some problems. Do you have some specific, I don't, there is no specific like vagrant setup. I just used a sort of I sort of manually set one up, and I assume you followed the those instructions, um, Jesse, right? And if you did, what are the um, things you ran into? So another question we have by an entire sleeve who has repeated it because I took too long to answer it is: What are some things that VHS devs need help with slash skills current developers don't have that would help the site? Um, there are, I mean, the way you asked that question is a little bit strange. No, I, I, I did it, I saw it, I meant to answer it, and then I missed it again. Um, um, but uh, this is one we get at often, but it's a good question to ask. Um, we need more devs that are uh, reasonably active. It would be my first answer to that. Um, we have lots of little things that would be more, it would be more quickly fixed that we could um, use uh, devs to do. We have, um, or here's a good example actually, 
if someone is an expert in configuring Elasticsearch and optimizing it for 2.6 billion or 260 billion or however many research documents we have, I forget what the actual number is. Um, if that was the case, then that would be something that we would love to have more help with. Um, the search is the search stuff was designed for two million documents, not billions of documents, and so we're starting to run up against a little bit of. Um, it's not big issues, but running up to just a little bit of issues with that as well too. And if we had someone who had experience uh, configuring, setting up, and tweaking and tuning um, that kind of setup, then I'm sure Lucas would gladly, from both from both from a perspective of the code level, so that where our code is translating the requests from users into efficient requests to um, Elasticsearch, as well as from the system administration level, so that um, our actual um, our actual server that's running Elasticsearch is configured to make optimal or as close to optimal as it can use of the hardware that it runs on. So that would be a very good one that's just come up recently. Um, going back to other potential skills that we have or don't have, uh, we I, I would think that if we had someone who was an expert in the Stri Stripe and PayPal APIs, um, I'm sure Tebow would love to have someone helping him uh, maintain that aspect of the code because it's not his favorite aspect of the code to work on. Um, he does it, he maintains it, I've helped as well. Um, new puzzles would be a good one as well too, as Ornicar2 points out, that's Tebow. Um, he's working on some new puzzle stuff and if someone, if someone has an expertise in puzzle categorization and puzzle uh, uh, discovery and how to evaluate what will be a good puzzle from the perspective of a user and what will be a bad puzzle from the perspective of a user, um, and how we can do all that sort of stuff. Uh, that would be a good project to jump in on right now. And even that one, we, we frequently are talking about that one. And I'm gonna plug this again. We have a Leechest Discord, which is linked both on this development page right here. And there is a command for that in the chat for Twitch as well too. And we have some development channels there. Um, one of the ones that we have is called how to set up Leela, which is where you should ask questions about how to set it up. And so Jesse, I'd recommend you jump in there and uh, ask questions about how to set it up there. Um, we'd more, be more than happy to review what's going wrong and try and point you in the right direction. In addition, we also have the Leela development channel, and that channel is reserved for active development purposes. And what that means, to, to, to give you my view on what that means, that means that you're actively participating in the discussion about how to develop something that we want. So most of the time that means what you can do is uh, participate in the discussions that we're having and like if someone asks, hey, I'm not sure how to implement this thing for puzzles, or I have this question about how to do this thing in Python for implementing puzzles, then you can participate in those sorts of questions. As well as if you've chosen a GitHub issue here, so if you've gone through here and found an issue you wanna work on, and you have some ideas or questions about that issue, that is also an appropriate channel to uh, um, request um, information about in there. Although typically for a specific issue, I recommend actually putting the information on the actual issue because that's a much more useful place to put it. But for example, if you're trying to do, I don't know, uh, if you were able to reproduce this one, let's say, right? And you're able to reproduce it and you're not actually looking to have more conversation about it. You're just asking some question like, hey, I've been looking for where this piece of code exists that does this aspect of it. I haven't been able to find that. That would be a valid question to put in the Lila development channel because uh, you're trying to help us get something done. We're more than happy to try and take that time and help navigate the code so that you don't have to spend that much time uh, figuring it out yourself. Um, going back to answering the question of things that we need, um, what would be something else? Um, if someone is an expert in how to, um, I mean, one of the problems that we're facing right now, and I don't know if this is even solvable by more experience, it might be only solvable by uh, better browsers, but the, the latest version of Stockfish uses a neural network um, for to evaluate some of the positions, and that neural network depends on certain CPU instructions in order to operate efficiently. And when we, we do our um, web ASM version of Stockfish, those CPU instructions are not available in the current version of web ASM. And as a result, the latest version of Stockfish does not compile and run well in our web ASM um, environment. So if someone feels like they have a way of potentially helping us solve that, where we can actually get the ver latest version of Stockfish running properly with its neural network evaluation um, in the browser, then I think that would be a uh, perfectly valid, um, uh, perfectly valid place for it to, to help us out as well too. And one last one that I have that I keep forgetting to bring up: if someone has expertise in PHP and OAuth, 
and would like to help us uh, improve the logging and error messages in our OAuth server, that would actually be a really big help as well too. The current OAuth server will frequently return a 500 server error or sometimes just a generic 400 user error um, in situations where it actually could return a much better error message, like check your settings, you don't have the right settings, as an example. And in addition, whenever we go to work on it and fix it, it doesn't log nearly as much information as we'd like it to log so that we can actually look into it ourselves. And all of us are recovering PHP developers. Um, and I say that with the kindest intent possible. Um, I shouldn't say all of us. Tebow and I are recovering PHP developers. And neither of us uh, enjoy working on PHP anymore. And so from that perspective, we do as little as possible to keep that thing running. And we had someone, so there was someone who kindly devoted the time to actually get it set up to begin with, and we really appreciate the work they've done. Um, they've also upgraded the, the version to use at some point as well too, so that we also very much appreciate that. So from that perspective, but uh, they're not around and doing active work on that a lot, so. Um, okay, that was a long-winded answer to a good question. What other questions have I missed here? The newest moves of a player, e.g. a GM, in real time. So Mark, this is the most recent question, not, the, not, not in order, so I'm gonna go a little bit out of order here. How can I fetch the newest moves of a player, e.g. a GM, in real time? So yeah, so LeechS has an API, and uh, it actually does provide you the facilities to do that. Um, I won't show you specifically right now the actual code to do it, but there's a few things you can do. Um, one of the things you can do specifically, because you'll need, you'll, need, you'll need two different uh, pieces for this. If you're just looking for the latest moves of a single specific game, then um, I'm not sure that we have that explicitly live, but you can ask for export where to go. Games export one game. So this is this is this this export one game in PGN format. You can call this to get the most recent uh, moves up to the most recent three are, are are not included, specifically for the reasons that are I think fairly obvious. Um, this is not a way for you to cheat against the GM. Um, so that's the reason why we do that. Um, and if you know the game ID, which is it's a required field for this, then you can um, pull this and you can pull it. I don't know exactly how often, but not super often. But you can use this, and this is actually what a lot of our partners use to broadcast games on on the chess. And it, you can also specifically ask for the latest ongoing game for a particular user here as well, too, and the same sort of thing. Um, last three moves are omitted. You can get PG or JSON format. And um, this is probably the best one to use to get the most recent uh, move. I probably wouldn't be great for Ultra Bullet games. Nope. <laughs> to be quite honest with you, why do you need the, may I ask, why you need the latest moves of a GM of an Ultra Bullet game? And have I missed any other questions so far along this time period? People have asked about uh, new variants. Uh, T35 Tor, we will not be adding new variants anytime soon. Variants are unfortunately uh, one of the least used parts of Lee Chess in terms of, in terms of it. It's, they're not very popular comparatively to regular chess. Um, and every variant we add typically requires us to change the way all of our games are handled to handle whatever version it does. Um, it increases the complexity of the code base. We can, removing variants is very difficult because you know the, the 500 people who play one specific variant get very angry if you even talk about removing it. And so as a result, uh, the, the likelihood that we actually um, add a new variant in the next century is pretty low. I'm gonna make a soundboard on a website. Interesting, it sounds like you'd be interested in, does anybody have the link to what Zug Addict did to do music for um, games. Yeah, I'm familiar with Dimitri, and uh, it's probably the reason why I can't watch Andrew Tang's strings, streams on a re re regular basis. <laughs> if someone has a link to that uh, Zug Addict pro um, project, that'd be um, great to show as well, too. Someone's working on their own four-player chess. I have no idea if it's copyrighted by other people, but pull requests that add new 
game variants, four player, other variants, whatever it is, are very unlikely to be uh, merged. So you can make one, but uh, the likelihood that we actually merge it is fairly slim right now, um, just because of the extra complexity it adds. I think we have far more important fish to fry at the, at the moment. Uh, maybe long term, long time down the road, we might actually consider adding something like that, but uh, for now, unlikely. So uh, the, the, my best recommendation for you would be to do, do something like what the lead drafts people did or what uh, PyChess Pi Chess guy di did, which is to actually make a new site that has the new variants on it. Um, and you can use Leela as the code base that you base this on. So if you want to make a set of pull requests and maintain that versus Leela, then um, you can maintain your own fork and run that yourself. Any favorite external apps that use the LeechS API to do something cool? Uh, so yeah, so Tivo mentions the LeechS 4545 league, which is pretty good. Um, so this league, which I'm part of, full disclosure, um, runs a number of different leagues for it. We run a team league, which is starting here pretty soon, and we run a, an indiv individual tournament, which is starting here fairly soon. And this uses a lot of the LeechS API stuff um, to do uh, to do various things. So that's one particular project. Um, the other one that I was thinking of would be the opening, what's it called? Opening Tree Explorer. I forget what it's called. There's a opening tree. Opening tree.com. Ah, oh, yes, this one. So this one from a user perspective is one of our favorites. Um, from an implementation perspective, it has uh, gotten itself banned for, from spamming us with requests in, the, um, in previous iterations. Although I believe that developer is actually open to feedback. And so from that perspective, he's changed things as far as I know, um, whenever we request it. But this one basically um, works on Leech API. So we can say, let's pull up, I'll just do someone random. So I can pull up some random opponent of mine. I want to look at his white games. I can click Analyze Games. This will start pulling in all sorts of different games from this person. And we find out that they really like E4 and sometimes mouse slip E3. Um, and have played D4 twice. And uh, three times, look at this. So it slowly pulls this and it starts to give you information about their specific openings. And T35 Tour, yes, our donations cover all of our expenses right now. We are very fortunate to have many people who donate to us on a regular basis. <laughs> it's literally one game, something pretentious. <laughs> oh, two games. Look at this, two games. Oh, boy. That's great. E3. You've played E3 as much now as you've played D4. The reverse Sicilian of some sort. <laughs> so this would be another uh, website that I think is uh, pretty cool and does some stuff with that. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones that do stuff. Uh, there was the guy who did the all-time tournament scores site based on the BeachS database. So we have the database.bchess.org, which uh, exports all of the games in a huge format. Um, and uh, one thing, uh, let's actually take some time to talk about this. So 1.6 billion games have been exported from Lee Chess, and this is just the standard rated games. Doesn't include variants. Variants are a lowly 10 million for anti-chess, which is apparently the most popular one, I think. But in any case, um, but these files are quite interesting to work with. Uh, they are huge. This is zipped up. This is a zip file and it's 17.5 gigabytes. So if you want to work in this, we actually use, and if you scroll down to the bottom, we actually talk about this. We actually use, where did this go? Um, this pbzip2 um, program, which is a parallel bzip. So if you want to actually unzip this and you have a modern computer with more than one core and you care about your times at all, uh, this is the better way to unzip these files. And in addition, um, there's some really interesting links to projects down here um, that are really kind of cool. So if you want the list of projects that use Leechess data, or Leechess, in this case, Leechess data, 
Um, this is a nice little set of, of, of projects here as well, too. And did we add the tournament? We should add the tournament. The guy who made the tournament um, links here. The, not the, the person who made it, the, who exported and figured out who had the all-time scores for, say, like um, the title arena or the shield tournaments or things like that. We should add those to these as well. I don't know if this is here. Doesn't look like it is. Oh, here. This is the bot that I was actually interested in. Nice. This bot was actually, I thought would be a fun bot to play against, where it basically chooses its move based on trying to figure out what the most popular move is in Lee Chess in that position. Which I think is cool. So yes, this is the... That is the other project I was talking about that uses the um, the, the Lee Chess database, and I think should also be added to this list if it's not there already. So I think that was worth that was uh, worth it. And Lucas uh, Gilbert asks if I am going to play viewers later on in chess, and the likelihood of that happening is very, very, very slim. But I will not rule it out completely. Um, but uh, it, it would be, uh, it's going to be pretty slim. Oh yes, this is the music thing. So this, uh, for the person who was asking about Hyperbolic Games and making a musical soundboard, um, Zug Addict actually did that on, uh, um, with uh, Java actually. So, but uh, he, he made a sort of thing that plays sound as you play a chess game, which is quite interesting. I, I recommend checking it out. Um, I don't know if it works for Hyperbolic Games. I'm going to guess it doesn't work well for Hyperbolic Games, but uh, maybe it does. All right, any other questions here to start off the stream, aside from whether or not Gilbert gets to play me? Just reviewing the questions here really quickly. So I'll talk a bit while I'm doing that, just so it's not completely silent. Okay. Doesn't look like there's that many questions. So let's go back here. And let's get set up. I did not actually Actually get this set up so it's probably quite far behind so I'm gonna do a little bit of setup right here how many computers run fishnet actively on a regular basis probably in that range um, I think Lucas can probably or Lucas or something percentage can probably get us more accurate numbers than that if you really want but it's somewhere in that range I'm just gonna get up a date with this And um, last time we talked about this bloop build server, not bloop the movie. So I'm going to talk about this again for a little bit. And what bloop is, as we, if you recall, is a server. So it's an alternative, uh, alternative um, service on your computer that runs that will compile scale-up projects. And it's intended to be able to buy, compile them quickly. Um, and it's also intended to be able to integrate with editors, which is the real, real big benefit in my opinion. The other benefits are probably, are still quite good, but uh, less good than uh, integrating with the editor. And so you can integrate this with different build products. So SBT is the one that LeechS uses, and you can integrate it with different editors, like Visual Studio Code, I forget what that one is, IntelliJ, Atom, and Vim. That's probably Sublime, I would guess. Yeah, Sublime. Um, and uh, the nice thing about getting this set up is that you get immediate feedback in your editor when you compile code. So let's see here. Push to my branch to make sure my branch is up to date. All right. Let's quickly do. I'm just gonna, yeah, that's fine. SSH keys. All right. 
right. I'm going to run an SBT really quickly because I want to make sure that bloop install has been run. I don't remember if I've set that up on this computer. I think I have. But I'll make sure. Leave a feature suggestion. This stream is not the right place to leave a feature suggestion. There are two places you could consider that. One of which is to join the Discord and go into the general channel and talk about it there, which is a place where you can try and drum up, drum up support for your feature suggestion if you think people will be interested in it. It's also a good place for your feature suggestion to be shown that it's not going to be as popular as it, you may think it may be. And if you're 100% convinced that your feature suggestion is a really good idea for Leechess, um, the best place is to um, add it to the GitHub issues here. Um, but again, unless you, I don't want to encourage everybody just to add every possible feature request that they can possibly think of here because we are somewhat judicious about which features we do add. But this is a good place to do it, both because it records it, so we know about it. It also means that we can sort of make sort of an official determination on it if we close your ticket, because with your feature request, if we close your ticket for your feature request, um, the resulting, uh, it's probably best to not try and suggest it again. Um, but this here and the general channel on Discord would be the two places that I'd recommend. And we do use async, I believe we use async Scala. Um, yeah, and the, and the bug house feature request was already received long ago and closed 40 times. Okay, so I'm going to run bloop install just to make sure bloop is installed here and running. I already have bloop installed on my computer and I showed different ways of doing that um, in my last stream, which is uploaded to YouTube. Um, I'm pretty sure... I mean, we use futures and promises throughout, um, and I always forget the difference between async and multi-threaded and concurrency, and I know there's a difference between the three terms. Um, the JVM runs with a certain number of threads. Certain aspects of the code base are definitely con um, async in the fact that they do not block, and uh, I think most of the code base is async in the fact that it does not block, but I don't know if we use specifically Scala async. Is that a specific project, Thibaut? Or is that just asking about the fact that it's uh, non-blocking? Uh, it's just syntactic sugar on top of futures. I understand. Then yeah, we do. Yeah, we don't use async right now. Um, it's all futures. Okay, Bluetooth install is running here. Now I should be able to do Vim. Let's do routes. Oh, routes. Just to pull something up. Let's look at this. It's game export. Let's see. Oh, metals are preparing. We will import the build. So if you have Bloop properly installed, it should actually do everything you need here. And I also use, while we're waiting for this to run, I specifically use a project called coc.nvim which is this, which is sort of an IntelliSense-like engine for Vim. And um, you can configure this to run uh, different language servers. So it actually runs across uh, TypeScript, it runs across Python, it runs across Scala, it runs across TypeScript, um, it runs across, I said TypeScript already, it runs across Go, whatever you want. Um, and uh, I'll get back to that question on 335 Tor. And specifically, there is a NVIM, sorry, NVIM Metals project. And this VIM Metals is basically the, uh, the thing that connects from VIM to your Bloop server to give you uh, IntelliSense uh, like um, code completion. So that's what this, this is done. So this allows me to, um, I think, no, it's not going to work today. Previously, when I had this set up, I could get this working in routes recently I haven't been able to, so I'll just do it manually. Controllers, game. And this gives you various information about the particular... Oh, I'll have to wait for it to compile again. So the initial compile always takes a while because it needs to compile everything. After that it uses an incremental compile process, so it uh, actually um, doesn't take nearly as long to compile files when you save them. Um, but it does need to finish compiling before I get any of these autocomplete features working. Just 
just looking back at some questions again. Thank you, Shenza Brat. It is a code completion add-on as well as a documentation add-on, etc. So it does more than just code completion. It also gives you documentation about where it, where, where the code, what the code actually types are and how you use it. It also gives you um, uh, code navigation, so you can ask it to take you to the definition of a particular um, method, stuff like that. So for example, let's find something here which actually would be useful. This context, for example, let's do shift K here. It tells me that the type is context as an example, or shift K auth. It gives me information about what the auth signature actually is, so I can tell what the auth signature needs to do. I can also do code navigation, so if I press the right keystrokes, it takes me to the right definition of this. It also does compilation stuff, so if I switch back to the place where I was, and I make some errors in my um, code, say like this one, it'll tell me that this is an invalid, um, uh, it'll compile the file really quickly and tell me that it's invalid. Invalid syntax or whatever it is. So give me the error for Scalar right, for give me my feedback right away on the code that I've been running. So this can be very helpful. Um, it also includes, I believe, a format extension too, which you can call. And going back to the onboarding um, document, which where did I close that? I closed that. So we require that your code be formatted using Scalar format, and you can install it for your editor. Um, specific editor, and I have it installed and configured to work with my um, coc.nvim. And so um, it's based on the Metals language server, so it works perfectly fine. So I can basically just ask it to format my file, and it'll format it automatically for me. And I am a big fan of automatically formatted files. Um, I work on far too many projects to remember all the details about how things should be formatted versus not formatted. One thing I'll point out about this bloop install, though, is by default when I'm running my editor, although it compiles stuff for me, um, I don't think the server will actually be running correct. And so you have to run, you have to get bloop running in the background, and the way that is not JavaScript, that was Scala, and the way you get bloop running in the background can be quite a bit different um, based on how you have it set up. And there are instructions for all of this here, which you can use. I actually have a, a version like I have a version set up that's similar to this, like what Tebow uses, I believe. Or actually, just let me see here. In, uh, no, I don't have that set up right now. So let's actually try it on my other computer. I have that set up. Let's try running it with this. to load. Did I need something else? It's not just the PWD then. Ah, uh, dot loop. So there we go. And it does not like my application comp, so let's open that. I do not understand why it does not like my application comp. bloop like this and what this does is it will actually run Leela for you using the bloop compiled code just making sure everyone else does it and oh yes this is the problem again so this is a problem that everybody runs into including me, um, it's a common one. 
and it's a good one. Basically, my MongoDB is not running. So in the instructions in the um, setup, you need to download, get MongoDB installed, but you also have to run it. And I don't have it running all the time because I don't actually use it all the time. It's not running right now, so we'll start it. I will also start Redis. And then let's run, run it again. Ooh, Rust, we have a Rust developer. My wife is laughing at me because I said, ooh, Rust. <coughs> um, but yeah, we actually like Rust quite a bit. We don't use it for the primary projects that much because um, Tebow is uh, more comfortable with and prefers Scala above it, but we do use it for a bunch of side projects. So Rust, and we also use Python for some side projects as well. So all, all, all three of those are super important for us. So if you have experience in them, definitely room for you to help. Um, so I look, and uh, one thing that I probably can't show enough on stream is if you go to leechess.org slash source, this is a really great page to get at some information about how um, people actually use uh, leechess, or sorry, what, what software is actually being used in uh, leechess. And uh, uh, you can see what, um, uh, which one's actually doing. I'm not even signed in, light mode's default. This is, this is what the Anon see. I'm not signed in on this browser either. No, um, the, uh, this browser is, uh, as I learned previously when I doxed myself twice, oh, you can switch in a non mode. So Tebow tells me I can say slash dark. Or just let it straight type it. Ah, oh, it's a keyboard. Man, there we go. Oh, look at that. Sweet. So there you go. Everybody's eyes better now. We need more, we need more, um, we need more uh, secret commands like this. Anyways, what I was saying here is, is that if you're a developer and you know a particular language, and you want to know if we use it, you can go to this page and see most of the repos that we use and what language they use. So for example, I can search for Rust on here. Check it out, Rust gets used quite a bit. Table base, our push service, our GIF generator, our IP to proxy generator, all use Rust. Python is used for the fishnet, um, support. It's used for our web board image project. It's used for Erwin. Um, it's also being used for the current um, puzzle generation as well, which I don't think is listed on here. I'm not sure if it should be, but probably. Um, or, or I'm not sure if that's super secret or something for some reason. But we use Python as well. We use Scala. Scala is used for quite a bit of stuff. And TypeScript is used for quite a bit of stuff as well too. And Java as well. So you're looking to contribute and you're not sure that you want to learn Scala right away, um, then this is a different way for you to contribute. And uh, we're also getting, the stream is also pointed out that slash help gives you all sorts of different um, commands. For example, you can type in slash bug house and I believe that should be a Easter egg of some sort. <laughs> I really do think typing in slash bug house should do something fun. Um, <laughs> But help does actually show you the real commands that you that are used here, which is a nice little feature. Ban the account. It's like a self ban. That's not a bad idea. It's just like, or a self mute. Type in slash bug house, <laughs> and you and you're immediately muted. Uh, this is not the right place to ask questions like that, Haraz. All right, where was I? Oh yes, so we were talking about Bloop. So the way Bloop's used in this is uh, in the background, you still get, if I go back to my um, project here and I immediately type in some more tactical problems, I get immediate feedback in my project. Um, and so from that perspective, in some ways, there's this concept of auto-loading here. And we talked about this this last stream and I didn't get it quite right. So that's part of the reason why I've talked about today is there is sort of a little bit of a concept of hot loading and immediate feedback that you get from Bloop in your editor. But um, the actual, when you run Bloop using this particular command or if you have it set up with your system cuddle um, command, um, it doesn't actually auto automatically restart the system. And part of the, re there's a few different reasons for that. The first one, which is the more important reason for me, um, is the fact that it actually takes five to six seconds for Lila to start up, and we don't want to continually do that. In fact, back when we used um, the raw plane, for the, the, the 
upstream play framework directly. It has an auto reloader built into it, and we were using that. And it actually caused problems where if you auto reloaded enough, eventually it would actually sometimes get into this really weird state, and you had to just kill it. Um, in addition, every time I save, I don't want it stopping and trying to restart because uh, I save often. So from that perspective, that's a super important thing for me. Another important thing, which is uh, more important for Tebow, is the fact that sometimes when he's developing, he'll write some code, he'll save it, he wants to know if that code compiles, it may not compile, it may still be in an error state. He doesn't want the server to automatically reload in that particular state. He wants to be able to continue to use the, the, the server in that, in that state as well, too. So from that perspective, let's say you were um, testing some bug, right? And you could you had a, some way, you had, you had it set up so you could uh, reproduce it on your current browser window. You want to be able to continue doing that while the compilation is happening in the background. So from this perspective, um, it, in order to actually reload the code and use the new code you've written, which is a slightly different workflow that I think most people are used to these days, you do actually have to restart this, which if you're using this version, you can do by pressing Control-C and pressing up. But if we go back to the actual instructions, a better way to do that is to actually install it in some sort of way so that you can very quickly do it. And what Tebow actually does here is he actually um, uses a systemd service for it, which I will get set up and installed on my computer here really quickly. Um, and then from there, he can he actually maps F, his F1 key. So he just presses F1, and when he presses F1, it automatically restarts it. And then he also has a service that notifies him when the restart completes or fails. So that way, when he's ready to restart it and actually try out the new code, he just can explicitly ask for that, as opposed to it happening immediately. So from that, from that perspective, um, this is uh, our current recommended way to work on um, Leela. So if you're actually considering hacking on the Scala and trying to um, do some work, we definitely recommend taking some time and getting this set up. And again, you don't have to use Vim like we do. You can use whatever editor you want because Bloop actually supports um, many different editors. And on the last stream, I showed you how to get it set up with Visual Studio Code, which actually just has a plugin. You go install that plugin, you press the little button, boom, it's set up, and you can start running that. Any questions on Bloop and why we use it and how to set it up or anything else like that at this point? Sixty-five cents. Yeah, Lee Chess actually. Um, so there's some comments going on in the chat about how much it costs uh, to run a game on Lee Chess. And Lee Chess, um, thanks to the tireless work that a bunch of volunteers have put in, Tebow, Nicholas, um, Lucas. Um, uh, there's way too many for me to name on the stream. Those three being some of the most important ones that put it in on the actual tech side. Um, uh, um, the, as a result of all of that, uh, uh, Isaac before um, Clarky. All these different developers. There's been a lot of work on making Leechess very efficient, and um, as a result, uh, the cost per game is actually quite low, um, and that's really cool. One other metric that we've talked about a lot recently, which we don't have a good way of measuring, but which is a really interesting metric, is the cost of uh, the actual processing power for you personally. So I pay for electricity, like everyone, well, you may not pay for it directly, but you somehow will pay for electricity. And so when you load, Chess from scratch, the total amount of requests in JavaScript that are loaded actually has an impact on the cost of Chess from a certain perspective. And so, um, where did the actual thing here go? Oh, that's the key thing I'm looking for here. And there's been a lot of work done on optimizing um, how many, how much kilobytes are actually served um, to, to 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 your client. It's very very low. It's something like. 20 times more optimal than a lot of the competing sites. I don't know if 20 is the right term, but it's orders of magnitude better. Um, and in addition, uh, one of the really interesting things about Lee Chess, which is really fun from an efficiency standpoint, is the, the minimal amount of actual J JavaScript you have to load on here. And that goes that comes from two places. One of which is the fact that Lee Chess has zero ads. So there is no JavaScript that's being run on your browser 
that you didn't ask for. So only the JavaScript that's needed to run LeechS directly is, um, is used. And that's actually super important from a client perspective. If you're using a mobile client, uh, your battery um, will love you for this. Um, if you're using, if you just, if you pay for electricity and care about the environment, uh, that's also a big benefit of as well, as well too. And in addition to the lack of ads, um, the other thing we also do is uh, uh, um, every six months or so, Tebow gets very obsessed for a few weeks with optimizing it and spends some period of time optimizing it, which he just recently com completed another another round, round of that and actually drove the actual um, uh, cost or the um, size of the JavaScript down farther and that each line of JavaScript you serve extra requires your browser to recompile that JavaScript every time you load the page. I mean, there's some caching that happens that is maybe not every time you load the page, but it's often enough that that actually makes a big difference. So reducing the number of kilobytes we actually send up JavaScript or CSS can make a big difference. Um, someone asked about uh, uh, server-side optimization. Honestly, I th we're actually in a really good place from the core features um, from from playing games. From that perspective, uh, we are in a really good place optimization-wise. We have a lot of headroom. We had to scramble really quickly during the initial uh, COVID um, increase in users, and we um, bought some bigger servers, and those servers are handling the new traffic very well, in addition to a bunch of code changes that we made to um, properly, um, to properly uh, deal with that kind of level of traffic. So from the core features, um, that's one thing. Uh, the places where we where we need the most help from an optimization standpoint, I'll go back to the Elasticsearch thing. So the Elasticsearch, uh, so searching in general, so going to and searching. So if I go to someone's games, I'll pick someone random again. Um, if I go here and click here and click this advanced search and press some buttons here, like I don't know, let's make this very classical. And I do this, this is using our Elasticsearch deck to uh, search for games, and that Elasticsearch stack um, needs some optimization on the back end. Um, so both how to translate requests like this into an efficient query for Elasticsearch, that's one aspect of it. I don't know how much room there is to actually improve on what we do, as well as how to actually optimize the Elasticsearch back end so that it, with the same, with approximately the same resources, could potentially serve up more requests and do this more efficiently. That's, uh, again, one of the places I think that we need optimization. Um, from the actual, the rest of the game stuff right now, there's no big need. And and we're always very cognizant of the fact that because we have as few developers as we want, premature optimization and making the code more complex is um, is a bit, uh, is, is not something we're super keen on. If we don't need to hyper-optimize some aspect of it because it's working well enough right now and, hy and hyper-optimizing it would decrease developer productivity significantly, then we may not consider doing it at all right now because honestly, our developers are probably one of our more precious resources, developer time, and uh, we don't have a ton of it. So we don't have infinite of it anyways. So from that perspective, optimizations are something we definitely don't chase for the sake of optimizations all the time. We, we definitely always evaluate them against uh, the developer productivity at the end. Yeah, we have our own OAuth. I don't think we will probably ever integrate with Google and Facebook because that means uh, loading their their tracking software effectively on our site. Um, and uh, I don't think that's super valuable for our end users. I certainly would be, would want to really understand the, the, the benefit of, of how that would help us, to be quite honest with you. Um, Supporting their system is just another source of a headache. Developer productivity. Um, every third-party API you add a dependency on and increases your developer, decreases your developer productivity because every single one of them comes back with some what they think is reasonable timeline. Oh, by the way, we just changed everything. You have six months to fix it. And now some developer is stuck spending those six months to figure out how to fix it. So from that perspective, um, it's uh, not necessarily worth it for us. Okay, I'm getting really sidetracked today. Any questions on Bloop and how we use Bloop before I move on? 
If not, then for those of you who just advertise that you have 12 cores, um, I'm going to really quickly talk about a different way that you can contribute to VHS if I can find it again. So VHS.org. Let's go to contribute. Or did that go to? Let's go to slash source first, slash source and contribute. So we, have, we maintain a page on how you can contribute here as well too. Am I a full-time dev? I'm not a full-time dev, no. I currently am a volunteer dev and the 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 title of developer <laughs> is probably a little bit of an ambitious one for me. Um, I am a developer in my real time daytime job, but I don't actually do that much raw development for VHS. I mostly just sit around and annoy Tebow with silly questions and silly suggestions. And sometimes those silly suggestions work out and it turns out to be better. And sometimes he just spends time explaining to me why it's a dumb idea. Uh, but I am part of the development team. So and I am a full-time developer. So going back to what I was going to say here, is there some, some other ways of potentially um, contributing to VHS? And one of the ways for that is to contribute to the, the, to the Fishnet, um, to the Fishnet uh, network that we have. How many of you here have Fishnet? I know I do. Do any of the rest of you actually run Fishnet for us? Um, yay, more people. If you do, thank you very much. It's very helpful. We appreciate it. Um, Fishnet is basically the way that we provide computer analysis for games. So if you go to a game, and I can't actually really do this, but if you go to a game, let's go to this game here, go down to the computer analysis. This analysis is provided by Fishnet. If the analysis is not here, you can click a button to request it. And that analysis is provided to us by um, a set of computers that LeechS runs, as well as um, donated resources for, for LeechS. And that's not at all the right page. Okay. And if you don't provide it, but you have a computer that is not a complete potato. Um, that's one way you can definitely consider um, helping us out is by um, offering to donate some amount of your spare CPU cycles. So um, from that perspective, uh, all you have to do is come here, go to the Git Fishnet. You then go through the appropriate um, on, um, form. So you just fill out this form, who you are, what your email address is, etc., etc. And let's do this. It's example.com. MSTF. Oops. Other way around. And then uh, you talk, you tell us a little bit about what you're planning on doing with it, why you want it, and uh, describe your actual CPU. And provided that um, your CPU meets our general requirements, which I think are basically listed here. Um, mm, I'm not sure Ellipse0934 asks if it would be more efficient to donate money so that we could rent servers and to donate um, fishnet due to electricity. I doubt it. I would be pretty surprised to find out that your home electricity time cost for fishnet is higher than the electricity we would use in, um, in a server room and the actual server as well too. And cloud computers are not the right solution to this. Um, it's much better to have raw, um, raw metal computers. Cloud, cloud computers do, don't provide quite as much or quite enough CPU power. They're not, you know, we just need basically raw CPU through, throughput at this point in time. So I'd be very surprised to find out that uh, it costs more running it from home in terms of electricity than it costs um, from a data center's electricity costs. And then renting the server on top of that and everything else you pay for in a server. So. Uh, but consider this, um, especially as we get more popular because there's lockdowns happening as we go through the second wave of this pandemic. And so from that perspective, if you have a spare CPU cycles and a reasonable CPU, consider donating. Okay. Hmm, let me, people, are, people are talking about specifics on the actual cost of power in Germany. I don't know much about the cost of power in Germany, so I probably can't <laughs> comment too much on that one. All right, any questions about Fishnet? We 
probably won't implement. Can I? Yes, I probably can implement Kung Fu Chess, but I probably won't. And if someone actually did implement it, we probably won't merge it either. Feed it, Master. What was the question that Medexes is talking about? We also accept potatoes now. Oh, so Tebow points out that uh, we actually accept lower power computers now. So uh, that's true. Lower power computers are also valuable to us. We figured out a way to um, use that um, in a useful way. So even if your computer is not uh, super um, um, powerful, you can definitely consider that. Feed a master, why not what? Why won't I implement your idea? I think you can probably answer that question. Fairly simple one. Haven't heard of what. How would what work? Shrek made it. Oh, with bot counts, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because uh, variants are ridiculously less popular than uh, primary chess, and it's code that has to be maintained. And developer time, as I have said many times on the stream, is our most precious resource. And so costing us developer time to maintain code that is barely used by even a fraction of a percentage of our users is not a particularly good idea in terms of how we um, allocate our developer time. So uh, right now, the likelihood that we add any new uh, variants is basically zero. Maybe that'll change in the future, but I doubt it. For now, I think we're gonna focus on uh, many other things that we think are more important. All right. So yeah, if you have a spare CPU cycles, go ahead and apply for Fishnet and help us out with that. And another thing that I'll point out with that, which is the last thing I'll point out, is you don't have to run this 24-7. Um, you can run it um, as often as you can run it, it'll help us. So if you run it you know, for four hours a day, that's helpful. If you, run a, if you run it for two hours a day, that's helpful. If you run it for three hours a week, that's probably still helpful. So any amount of time you can donate with this is, is definitely helpful for us. So consider that. Any other questions about Fishnet, or should I move on? Colonel Compile asks, any plans to switch to talk stock Fish 12 for analysis? Um, and I'll get back to your other questions as well. Um, yes, but there are plans. We would love to have it on there. But Stockfish 12, I believe, is the first version that has uh, a neural net a CPU based neural network to evaluate certain positions. And as it stands right now, that neural network depends on specific CPU instructions to run efficiently. And those CPU instructions are not supported by WebASM, which is how we provide Stockfish 12 for analysis. So there has been a little bit of work that's gone into it, but it's actually um, uh, not trivial and so we're, we're definitely working on uh, working on that and that's something we'd love to have help with so if you know how to get Stockfish 12 running efficiently in a browser using WebASM we'd happily take your expertise on that and Fishnet does not require an inbound port because it polls for the positions that it wants to analyze so it basically asks the server hey do you have any work for me the server goes yeah analyze this game here's all the positions and then it starts analyzing the game in reverse order so it starts at the final position and goes backwards for some reason I fail to remember and every time it analyzes some position, I think it analyzes a few, like three or four or five or something like that. And then for every few that it analyzes, it basically sends that data back to the server and says, hey, I've analyzed these particular positions. Here, here they are. And so that's why when you request an analysis on the server and you watch the analysis board, it fills in from right to left because it's actually analyzing the final few positions and slowly going back further and further in the game. And um, Todovsky, who is, who is one of the uh, customized stockfish Developers for the chess says that it, the reverse traversal maximizes the cache hit rate, which ostensibly improves Stockfish's performance. Anyways, and the, you submit those requests, and when you're done with that particular game, you then request a new game. And so it's all polling. So your client basically constantly just requests data from um, Lee Chess or submits it back to Lee Chess. Lee Chess never actually contacts your client.
Um, Post lunch asks if we think Fishnet would be open to a patch that allows builds for ARMv8. It's possible in the underlying stockfish. I think Fishnet would be open to those patches. I don't know if Leechess itself would be open to having stockfish run on ARMv8. I'm also unfamiliar with, and maybe you can actually um, answer this question for me. How performant is ARMv8 comparatively to AMD64 with stockfish? Is it like? And you can give me a rough estimate. Is it like 25% as performant? Is it like 3,000 times more performant? Like, what are we talking about here? Um, but uh, Fishnet is sort of a separate, it's separate, it's a separate project from Leela, so it's not directly integrated in it. Um, and it'll, it, it can be used in other contexts as well. So from that perspective, it may very well be interested in a patch like that on its own. I can't answer it for the developer. Um, that de uh, Nicholas would have to answer that for you. But I definitely think that you could um, open a GitHub issue on the on the actual repo and uh, ask that question. He would answer for you as well. Ah, okay, interesting. I mean, it would be very simple for you to um, do that with the current fishnet. So the current fishnet, if I go here and I open up the fishnet.py code base, um, the current fishnet actually will download. And let's see here. Somewhere in here, it actually updates the uh, I don't know if we will find this quickly on the stream, but somewhere in here it actually updates and downloads uh, the most recent of the of the official fishnet or um, stockfish builds that it uses. And you can tell it not to bother updating it again. So you can start fishnet on a server like that, and it may actually complain about not being able to run that fishnet. Well, I think actually the config, let me see if the ini, example ini, no, fishnet.py. Let's look this up here. So the config, so this is where it downloads the GitHub release. So this is where it actually looks for a new one. Um, and you can actually update the config to not update with new versions. And you can also um, pin it to a specific version. But I believe that Leela won't accept your request if you're um, passing the stuff from versions that it doesn't accept. Um, but you should be able to configure it to actually... Where's that introduce dogfish command? I think this might be it. Fix back off. System back off. Yeah, I think you can give it a specific fishnet command and a specific Indian directory. And as a result, it'll run that specific stockfish for you. So if you want to want to do this, you sh and you can build stockfish for ARM V8, then you should be able to set up and test fishnet with it. Just don't use your key you just got. Try testing it with a dev environment or something like that, so that you can um, so you can test it and give us a give us a send us a GitHub issue or join us on the Discord and mention it there and let us know what the actual performance is because I think that's something that most of us would be at least. Uh, from a pure technical perspective, interested in knowing. So definitely. This is about coding for chess. I am the one 1506. Any other questions about fishnet or contributions in this manner? No, okay. Then I am going to go back to talking about one other thing that I had. Uh, because there are some technical difficulties, sleep above all, um, it uses a neural net. That neural network depends on CPU instructions that do not work in the web ASM environment. And thus the performance of Stockfish 12 in a web environment is actually pretty poor compared to the Stockfish 12 directly natively on a CPU. And we are working on solving it, but there is no current solution. In fact, there may not be a current solution until the web, A web ASM technologies um, improve enough to actually provide those types of CPU instructions. We may need a Stockfish 12 command. And if we make one, can we call it Stockdish? I'm seeing far less contributions in the chat. I'm suddenly worried that I'm not connected. But 
it still looks like everything's connected here. Okay. Going back to what I was going to talk about next. So, chat is here. Okay, good. So the, the next thing I was going to work on really quickly was just showing you how to do a few more steps within this within this uh, development setup. The last time we did it, we got to this point, so we actually got Leela WS working. So I'm going to go do that as well. So let's go here. SPT. This stream is a development. This stream is a development stream. Pluffy. Let's run Leela WS. We are nerds. I'm perfectly acceptable accepting that. So long as you are also per acceptable uh, using the term nerd to describe chess players and or Twitch viewers, because I would also use that term for the most part. So going back, if we run Leela WS, that's required for us to actually have uh, with the WebSocket connection, which I, which I uh, talked about last time and won't cover today, which allows you to play games. But it doesn't allow you to play games with the computer. If you click this and start a new game, it actually won't work. For that, you need to do two other steps. So the first one we need is we need this repository. So let's do that as well too. Let's get Leela Fishnet. Let's go in there. Oops. That's the wrong thing. The, this is what I want. So people can actually see what I'm doing. And going back here, we'll run that command. And this will run a uh, Scala based um, uh, fishnet controller, basically, for Leechess. Is it going to help you with your Spring Boot project? Probably not. But uh, it is about running Leechess locally, correct? Okay, so now we have Leela Fishnet running, which was the second step here. And we also need to have a copy of Fishnet running, so I will also do that. So let's go here, let's call it Fishnet. And then run it with the appropriate endpoint. And this is the endpoint that I was talking about earlier. So Fishnet actually connects to Leela and listens there. So when I run this, it's actually going to connect to this one. And it asks you a few questions when you first start up, which creates an INI file. And I believe that um, you can, this is where you can override it to run a different stockfish. And let's only use uh, four today. And um, creeper kind, I don't know. And Probably not required. So I'm going to skip that because I don't think it's required locally. And we are getting some HTTP failures for localhost on port 9665 because Leela Fishnet is running on port 9000 for some reason. I am running Leela Fishnet. This is Leela Fishnet. Just brand new, freshly checked out, and I did SPT run. But it is running on port 9000, which I can fix manually by going to here and running this to connect to port. 9,000, um, which I believe will work, but the instructions on the wiki should probably be updated. Either Leela Fishnet needs better default configuration, or um, the instructions should be updated to use this, I think. I'm not sure which one of those is incorrect. Regardless, um, the Fishnet requires a particular endpoint to connect to, and for the version that we use to play against the computer, because this Fishnet's also used for playing against computer. Yes, Ornicar2 is TiVo. Welcome to the chat, K, K the Joker. Um, 
he also has his own stream. So a quick shout out to his own stream. He sometimes streams himself doing real coding on BHS as opposed to just this sort of pretend coding that I do on these streams. In any case, uh, Lee Chess needs an in, uh, sorry, Fishnet needs it to connect to an endpoint, and you can provide that custom endpoint here. And now, if I go back to here, I should be able to click play with the computer. Let's get my butt kicked by a level one stockfish, real time, one minute, random. Let's see if this actually works. Interesting. Lila event loop, Lila stop. Why did Lila stop? Let's see if I can debug this. My posture looks really good. I guess that's a compliment. You can only see my shoulders and up, so I'm not sure how much posture you can actually see, but uh, thank you. Okay, so let's look through this again. So we have our code open. Oh, Leela, is Leela not running? So Leela WS is running. No, Leela is running. That's Leela Fishnet. This is Fishnet. Leela itself is not running. And the problem here is. Oh, ha 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 ha. I forgot to. Do my Java command. So I'm running an old Java command here. So let's go restart all of these things and run them in the appropriate version of Java. That one has to say running the fishnet Java. This can go running. Just as a quick reminder, um, when you want to run this stuff, you need to use the appropriate version of Java, and that is listed on the requirements page here, right here. And it says greater than 11, um, but I would recommend you use Java uh, uh, 1.14 at least. Okay, so Leela's running. Uh, Leela, which one's this one? Leela Fishnet is running, and Fishnet is running, and let's also do Java here. Sure, that was actually running properly. So that one's running, fishnet's running, fishnet ws. And this one was not using it, so let's do that one. Let's try Lila WS in the right version of Fishnet as well. I do do some updates on LeechS, yes. You've already asked some questions for of me. Yeah, Java. Java is a really nice um, way to isolate your Java uh, virtual machines and JDKs. So it's kind of like uh, uh, NVM for. That would actually be quite nice, Hornet Car. I agree. It'd be nice to have something where you could basically could give you just a quick checklist and link to the instructions, um, and a quick, a simple script would be perfect. Just a TypeScript command you can run. So like UE build, just do that. Be like. Uh, test services, checks Mongo, checks Redis, checks Lila WS, checks Lila Fishnet, checks all those things, tells you whether they're required, whether they're optional, ding, 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 ding. Good idea. So uh, Java is basically like NVM, which is a node version manager. This manages um, uh, Java versions, so you can run different versions of Java. You install it using a command like this, and then in your terminal, you can run Java LS remote, It'll tell you which um, Java versions are available. You can find the one you want. You can type in Java install, so Java install this, you can install it, and then you can type in Java use, and now when you do that, your Java version will be the one you asked for. Super useful. 
So ostensibly, if I've done this correctly, let's go back to here. I should be able to play with the computer and get wrecked. But it is crashing. This Mongo connection is closed. And that is probably due to some other version. It still does not like the encoder version. No, Mongo's still running. I think this uh, crash has caused um, Leech has to be allowed to get into an invalid state. And then it eventually tries to stop. And while it's trying to stop, this is just some weird herring that happens at the end where some Mongo, it's just finally uh, doing some Mongo stuff. So I believe the actual real error is this one up here, which is that um, the Leech uh, encoder is compiled with a more recent version 55. So let me actually do, there is a way to clean this, right? It still says it's using Java 1.8. That would be the problem. So for some reason my bloop is not using my Java. Mm. Hmm. What did I get wrong here in terms of this? Let's uh, try something out while that's working. Yes, it is correct. Blue is running on Java 8. And I don't know why. Always blend the database, of course. You blend the database immediately. What's overpowered? Fluffy? Still running on Java 8. Do some Googling here. Loop use Java version. I do not have a bloop bloop.json, so how do I figure out which Java help? Oh, which open, sorry, uh, use in Java, which so JSON. That there, it's not actually valid JSON, but that's fine. Let's take this, take that. There, now we have loop. Supposedly running the right version of Java. And let's try running it again and see what happens.
I'm not running Bloop as a service. Uh, Tebow, I haven't set that up today on stream. I've been running it just directly here. And uh, it did not like that. It still thinks it's running Java uh, 1.8. Bloop. Install bloop via the AUR. Oh. And is there a way to stop it? P kill does. Process kill based on name or other attributes. Okay. It's still running. Oh, I know why it's running. This is going to keep it running. Java. Use Java. I always afraid I have to do this. Um, app controllers. version of Java. So yeah, so if your editor starts Java, you have to make sure your editor starts the right version, which was the issue that I was running into. So now I can run bloop space run lila. In fact, let me do a clean first, just to make sure. matter the order you start these processes in when you're developing? I'm assuming it does. I probably need to wait until... Or no, they use Redis to communicate, I think. So it might be fine. Okay, application started. Let's go back here. Not quite yet there. Not listening. Oh, that's the wrong one. That's Fishnet. Here we go. This is the one I want. of uh, updating in a URL. It doesn't look like I'm hacking into the CIA. <laughs> okay, one more time. Nope, still thinks it's running using the old Java. Again, 
this is using a more appropriate version of Java by, by default, it looks like. Sleep above all. Uh, this is exactly what coding is, honestly. Coders spend probably half their time fighting with software configuration. That's why experienced software developers get paid more, is because they spend a little bit less time doing this and more time actually coding. <laughs> okay, we're starting from scratch again with Bloop. One more time to run it. Ah, oh, I see. Wonder how many how many user how many viewers I've lost by fumbling through this for the last little while. Honestly, I think personally think that uh, streams that are about setting stuff up actually are better and more useful when this sort of stuff happens on stream because otherwise it's not realistic. So from that perspective, I don't actually mind the fumbling. This output already looks different, so I'm assuming this is actually working properly. <laughs> Medexus says the worst thing he ever had was trying to fix a bug for two weeks and it was just a wrong configuration. Yeah, I spent two days trying to fix a bug in university once when it turned out that I was just running an old executable. So, uh, yeah, every dev's been there at some point in time. All right, this time it looks like we're using the right Java. Look at that. Starting to have hope that this is actually going to work. Oh boy, let's go. Let's go here. That has not worked yet. That's still there. That's still there. Oh, I'm going to lose on time here. Ooh, free night. I like free nights. So this is the closest you're going to get to me actually playing chess on the stream. I can take that right. So on actual, um, on actual Lee Chess, Stockfish level 1 is a lot of fun because they move really fast. And so from that perspective, it... Uh, is actually quite difficult to beat. Not pretty much, pretty much impossible for me to beat. But uh, so far, it seems pretty good here. Let's do that as well. Let's do that. I will take your queen. I'm gonna finish this game. By the way, I'm not gonna chicken out here. I will keep my rook. Your rook, I will keep my rook again. Uh, short black spiders. I'm totally gonna lose on time here, aren't I? Was on time. <laughs> I managed to beat Stockfish level one. <laughs> Yay me. Okay, so that's the basics of how you set up uh, Lee Chess Fishnet to play against the computer. Um, you need basically just these three these commands here, uh, which I ran, but you also need to make sure you're uh, running them on the appropriate version of Java, which I wasn't. I was running them on a very old one, which was older than 11, which was the real problem. See you, Ornick Car. Have a good evening. And so the other thing I was going to do really quickly is set it up slightly differently here. So supposedly for stockfish analysis, I can run the same, use the same stockfish, but run it slightly differently here. So let's try that. And Austin. 
ostensibly, if I do this, I can then go back to this game and request an analysis. Uh, oh, I didn't sign in. Go to localhost.663. I believe I have a computer here. Oops. quickly switch off of that. All right, I'm back, I'm signed in. Let's go back to this game. I can now request a computer analysis. And ostensibly, this will happen over on this screen. Let's see whether it actually works or not. Just looking at the other questions here. So far, not working. Let's go back to the onboarding and make sure I didn't mess anything up. I did not mess anything up. Okay. I was fully expecting this to work. Let's make sure all the rest of it's working. WebSockets are working. Maybe the fishnet is working. This one's working. And Did not like something here for the analysis. And yep. That's great. Just docked my email address again. <laughs> fishnet is not it probably is the port but I don't know which port it is because um, leechess is actually running on port 9663 so that's Leela WS leechess here Leela whatever my email address has been doxed 15 times in the stream I'm not gonna continue worrying about it um, Leela is actually running on port 9663 so from what I understand, that should be fine. Um, so Sleep Above All asks a really important question, which I meant to address at the beginning and forgot, uh, and that's the schedule for the stream. I'm generally going to try and keep to a every two weeks on Tuesday, on Sunday, approximately this time. So that's 10 a.m. local time, my time, which currently is 1700 UTC. Um, but when the time changes back in the spring, it'll be 1600 UTC. So for right now, the general plan for me is to try and keep to an approximately every two week schedule and do it for about an hour to two hours. Um, and do it uh, uh, in that particular perspective. Abadesi, I am explaining what I'm doing. Um, if you just joined the screen though, I'm basically trying to uh, set up a leechess development environment and showing you, to, showing you how to set up different steps and failing to set up a particular step right now because for some reason, um, when I requested this, oh, no, it worked. There you go. Yeah, 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 I just wasn't noticing it. So it actually did eventually end up working. Just maybe it was a bit slow to actually get the to get the um, to get the command, but it eventually did get the command. It processed it all, and eventually was done. Perfect. So I guess in this particular case, maybe just assigning a task to this fishnet might be just a little bit slower than normal, but uh, in the end, it worked. Okay. 
that was the second thing I wanted to cover for today, um, which was just setting up the fishnet stuff. Ostensibly, it's fairly simple. Um, we do do quite a bit of work trying to keep it simple. And uh, most of the time things work. Primary thing you need to focus on is making sure you have the right versions of every piece of software. So these versions here, making sure you're running with them. If you're using something like Java or NVM to install different versions of Node or Java, then you should make sure that you're actually using them properly, like I wasn't. Making sure you run MongoDB and Redis. And then everything else is fairly simple here as well too. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about covering today would be a little bit of Leechess API usage. Um, is anyone actually interested in seeing a very brief introduction to that? Because I feel like that one might actually be a better thing to do with a little bit more of an in-depth introduction to it in a separate stream. But if people are interested in seeing some basics, I'm definitely happy to take you through some basics. Any particular piece of the API you'd like to see post-launch? One other thing I'll take a quick moment here to discuss is I'd love to have your feedback on what I should cover in upcoming streams. And probably the best way to do that is to join us on the Discord and to make suggestions in how to set up Leela, which is where I primarily discuss the, um, the topics for the stream or in the general programming channel. Either one of those would work. Join us there. Um, let me know what you would like me to cover. If there's some particular aspect of Leela that you don't understand how it works and you'd like me to cover some specific um, the code and how it works, I'd be more than happy to uh, um, more than happy to cover that. And uh, if you, or if, like, I don't know, you wanted to learn how to use the API or the OAuth, um, or you just wanted to, honestly, if you just are like, I'm new to Scala, Scala, and I'd love to see someone else struggle with Scala, I'd be happy to struggle with Scala on stream for you. That's something I'd be more than happy to do. Um, so US, there is actually already a Todovsky. There is already, um, so there's been two requests in terms of what APIs to use. I don't, actually, I don't actually know how to use the boards API yet. So that one would be something I think I'd prefer to spend more time on on a stream post lunch. So that would be something I think would actually be a really good one um, to do, but as a sort of a one stream in itself itself, just how to use the boards API and go through it completely from start to finish. Um, the Todovsky, the actual, the um, USCF, uh, studies in Lee Chess, Indie Radio, studies in Lee Chess, the interactive mode would be interesting. What would you like me to cover on that? Going back to Todovsky, there is already a couple of API methods you can use um, that uh, will give you that. And one of them is, where did it go? Games. This one. So this one right here actually allows you to stream the games played between a list of users in real time. This is actually what we use for the 4545 Slack, okay? Um, same with me post-lunch, same with me. Um, and what you can do is you can give it a list of usernames and you can support up to 300 uh, per request. And when you give it that list of usernames, what it will do is it will only show you games It'll show you game events for the players who are in that set, but both players have to be in that set. So in terms of you organizing a tournament, it's actually quite useful because if you know which players are in, in your tournament, you can basically make this request, and it's a streaming request. So you actually make the request, you stay connected, and then Leech Chess will actually stream in um, uh, any game information for people who are going to, who, any game, game events. And those game events include the game started and includes the game ended and the result of the game. And we actually use this in the Lee Chess 4545 League to watch um, and to automatically gather game results. So, for example, if you're the Lee Chess 4545, excuse me, and you go here, there's probably nothing on TV because none of these tournaments are actually actively working. But if you click on the TV board, um, during the season, we can actually show you who's currently playing because we've used that to track it. And then as well, all of the previous results, so all of the results in here, so all these results are automatically tracked by, by that same bot feature. Um, and it's actually fairly easy to use. Um, so let's, I can actually demo that fairly quickly on stream. Yeah, post launch you should join us, but you do have to have a non-provisional rating. So play some more and then apply. Uh, IJH, I am talking about the API a little bit, but uh, I'm not going in depth. I'm just gonna, I was just quickly asking if people wanted to see me talk about it for a brief second. 
Um, the API is actually quite simple to use. Um, specifically, this method is actually quite easy to use. So for example, uh, if I pull up a piece of code here, yeah, let's move these those to scratch. Watch.py. use Python requests to do this really quickly. And Python request has this idea of streaming. I always have to look up how to do. For this, so we will say users equals And then we'll do this. And this will be the leeches. Leeches.org. We'll grab the URL from the API. Uh, where is it? Games. Stream current games. So grab this. It will be a post. That's what this means here, this post documentation. So we need to change that to a post. Stream equals two, and then data equals users. Sorry. I think I just put data equals users in here. And then we go through and print this. I can run this. Now this won't work because uh, something pretentious and I'm not playing the game right now. But if I go to leechest.org TV, I can find some people who are playing games. So this game is close to being done. Let's see if I can type in their names fast enough. So Vic Tor Solo and Love. So if I watch them. Love you of. No, I got his name wrong. So if I do this, yeah, this little game takes too long to actually give me an event. I want one that has an event here right away. So this guy's going to run out of time soon or lose. So one of the two things will result in us getting the event that we want. Oh, I forgot to import Jason. So. They're playing again, but now they're playing this. Let's try these guys. Yes, this is I3, correct. Actually, IGH, I think um, a stream on how the, how we could feasibly use the API to run clubs to run automated tournaments um, is probably a good idea. So I think that's something that maybe I, that's a good idea for a future stream. So I need to make a place where we can keep track of all of these streams. There we go. And did I get their names wrong? Yes, I did. It's underscore underscore. So getting the name IDs is, is, an, is an important aspect of what you need to do here in Camel Gallo. That one I got right. Um, underscore. And these are user IDs, not user names, which are all lowercase. That's one important thing. But uh, yeah, we'll let this one go until they actually finish. And they seem to be playing a match, so we should get some more um, event information here. They are uploaded to the UHS YouTube channel. Yeah, they are. Um, IJH, not sure why you think they might not be. Hello, Jigsaw Rush.
just gonna sit here and watch this game play for a little bit until we actually get some events here. But as an example, Todovsky, you can definitely uh, use this particular thing to watch the results of games. There you go. So they finished, so we got a game, the game ID, got whether it was rated, the variant, speed, when it was created, which players were involved, and more importantly, the status, which is the result of the game. And then they started a new one immediately as well too, and so we also got this here, which is the start of the game. And so using both of those. So what I did, um, Wing Lives, how, how much of a newbie in programming are you? Because uh, that'll change my answer for that. But what I did is I used a library for Python, so I'm using Python for the programming language here, and I used a library called Requests, and that library is a well-known library in Python which allows you to do HTTP requests, which is how we actually do um, API requests for, for Leachess. So from that perspective, um, you need something that speaks HTTP. And for Python, I highly recommend this request library. It provides one of the most simple APIs for it. And um, in this particular case, what we do is there's this URL that we have for Leachess, which was documented for us on the Leachess um, site. And we call that URL or make a post request to that URL. We stream it, which basically means that we stay connected to it. So we stay connected and it will send us more and more information, which is why we can continue to get more events down here. And they just finished again, so we got another event. And then we basically, this is the way we iterate over each of the response lines that we get from them. And then we decode it from UTF-8, which you shouldn't have to worry about right now. That's a more advanced topic, don't worry about it. And then we decode it from JSON into JSON. There is auth on the APIs. Some of them are open though. For this, for, for example, for this particular one, this doesn't need to be protected at all because of the fact that um, you can go to leechest.org slash TV Right? and watch it. So the knowledge of the fact that these people are playing and uh, um, they still are playing. Let's find this game. Oh no, maybe they finished. But the fact that these people are playing is not private. Um, so from that perspective we don't see any reason to uh, protect that. On the other hand, there are things that are protected behind the API, behind auth when necessary. And yeah, the Java code would be about 400 times longer because you'd have to have a single file for every piece and have to import 25 things and deal with all the different exceptions. Um, but uh, you could definitely do it in Java as well too. I'm serious, the Java code. I, I, I worked on getting this exact thing working in Java when I was helping someone in the Discord oh, two months back and it was a pain in the butt, royal pain in the butt comparatively to using something like Python or Scala or I don't know, Rust. Like even Rust would be simpler than this. <laughs> I mean, Java is the reason why IDEs writing code for you became popular because people didn't, because people were like, I shouldn't be expected to write this code. And so they made IDEs write it for them. And so in some ways, the best way to write Java is to basically like, like put on your mech suit called IntelliJ or your mech suit called Eclipse and click the right button so it writes all the code for you. But I think that's what people realize and eventually, um, the same request in Scala? Uh, probably, although I'm planning on finishing up in five minutes, so I won't be doing that today. Um, but I definitely can do something like that. I can, on the hand, just quickly Google um, Scala HTTP streaming client. So let's pick one random one. Pick this one. So there you go. So basically we can call, set up a few things. This is with Akka, which sometimes makes things feel a little bit more complicated as well too, but just something like this would work. And we would just need to appropriately set up the HTTP request to be a post request to make sure we actually included the stuff and yada, yada, yada. look a little bit better. Yeah, this one's a little bit better. So basic request dot post the appropriate thing and then work on, work on top of it there. Fishnet client dot jar. You have no idea what fishnet client dot jar is. 
um, Edwin Walker and says, can I stream each move um, in from the API? Um, you can. It's not It's not streamed, though, I don't believe. I believe the appropriate way to do that is to ask for the ongoing game of a particular user, which, uh, no, that just shows you the actual games. Let's see here. Explore ongoing, this one. This one gets you the moves, but it's uh, slightly behind in time for cheat protection purposes. I have no idea what fishnet client.jar is. Set landing. All right, it's been about two hours. I'm gonna start winding down the stream now. Um, if you have any other further questions though, please feel free to ask them and I'll try and answer a few really quickly. I mean, fishnet is not from the Python fishnet client because I just ran it in text mode and it did not have a graphic login prompt. So I have no idea what you're talking about. The server is text only. The, the Freshnet client is text only as well too. Um, for that particular question set Len, it's probably best for you to join us on our Discord and ask there. And then you can maybe provide some screenshots of what you're seeing and we can walk you through um, what's going on. Ask it in the general programming or how to set up Leela um, channels. Any other questions before I shut it down? So yeah, just as a quick reminder for everyone else, I'm going to try and do these um, every two weeks. So again, in two weeks on Sunday, it'll be at the same times, so about 1700 UTC. Give or take a few minutes, depending on how late I sleep in. I think I just asked that, I just, just answered that a very bad player. Um, if you're asking about the, the, the uh, dev stream, that's when the dev stream will be. There will be other streams um, between then that'll be non-dev streams, but uh, for development streams, that's when we'll that's when they'll plan the next one. Glad you were able to show up as well, IJH. Edwin, glad you learned something as well too. Awesome. Thank you, very bad player. Very bad player. All right. I think I will hit stop streaming now and I uh, will see you all. In two weeks. Goodbye.